All right, kids, it's time we talked about Aristotle's take on style. Remember when we started talking about Aristotle's rhetoric? You know, like just over a year and a half ago? Well, we've got more to talk about today as we dip into book three and Aristotle's wise words on style. And it might seem like we've been dragging this out, but honestly, a year and a half seems like a pretty good pace for reading a book. I mean, what's the rush, really? Where are any of us going? At least Aristotle's not going anywhere. But I guess that's a little macabre. What really matters is that we're talking about style today, and that's a whole thing by itself, because style is the thing that I have the most opinions about. So if you think you're getting a level-headed, objective overview of what Aristotle has to say, well, you're driving right towards disappointment. And I'm sorry, but I just can't help myself. Actually, what he has to say is pretty harmless, but one thing that does often get lost when we talk about Aristotle's rhetoric is that he's not really talking about all of rhetoric in all times and places. If you remember our very recent discussion of the three species of rhetoric as he defines them, forensic, deliberative, and epideictic, well, they're all forms of political discourse in ancient Greece. Since then, we've broadened Aristotle's thoughts and applied them to other things, I think reasonably, but his original focus gets to be especially important as we head now into the final sections of the text. That's because, sure, maybe the exact ways that Aristotle talks about emotion or credibility or things like that aren't totally applicable to our current rhetorical situations, but emotions and perceptions of credibility still really matter. And style still matters too, but what Aristotle says counts as good style, and what we'll be talking about today is what Aristotle thought counted as good style for public political discourse in ancient Greece. So I don't think his description of good style should be taken as a set of rules for good style in all times and places. And you probably know that, but it's still important to say. At least when you've frittered away as many years of your life studying rhetorical style as I have, you can see how many people have a tendency of taking good advice for a particular context and then running with it as if it were a set of general rules for all contexts. And then when I tell people that I work as an English professor, the first thing they always say is, oh, well then I better be really careful about what I say, as if the rules that professors applied to academic papers 60 years ago apply to casual conversations today. And more importantly, as if I were going to critique anyone's grammar for free. I've grown quite accustomed to getting paid for it, and I'm not going to do it when I'm off the clock. But this is probably more than any of us asked for. Long story short, Aristotle outlines what have come to be known as three virtues of style, characteristics of effective rhetorical discourse, and on some level, they're good principles. But just remember that they're really meant for giving political speeches in ancient Greece. And what is good advice for that context may not be the best advice for someone writing a novel or research paper in the 21st century. But that's enough of me yammering. Let's get right into some more of me yammering. Aristotle leads into the virtues of style by saying, let the virtue of style be defined as to be clear. Speech is a kind of sign, so if it does not make clear, it will not perform its function. And neither flat nor above the dignity of the subject, but appropriate. And that gives us our first two virtues, clarity and propriety. And clarity sure did catch on, much to my chagrin. And I get it. If you have something to communicate, you want to make sure that your writing actually communicates what you mean to say. But the drumbeat of clarity has come at the cost, I think, of a lot of expressiveness. So my question when clarity comes up is always, clarity with respect to what? And I think for Aristotle and for a lot of people since, clarity means propositional transparency. When I want to refer to a chair, I use the word chair because it is the clearest way to get you thinking about a chair. And then we start riding the slippery slide to a dismal realm where clarity and plainness merge into one flavorless amalgam of semantic purity. And then you end up with editors who start slashing words they think are unnecessary, and humorless goobers who complain about poets being pretentious and refusing to just say what they mean in clear, simple terms. Now, I already spent some time in a longer video talking about this, and I'll probably make an even longer one before the year is out about the same thing, but for now, I'll just point out that, yeah, chair probably is the most efficient way to get you thinking about the object known by that name, but that plain and clear word can also obscure so very much. Imagine, for example, if instead of saying chair, I said straight-backed, flat-seated torture device. That is not the clearest way to put an image of a chair in your head, 
but it is infinitely clearer about my attitude towards that chair than the optimally clear word chair could ever be. And this is why I will always take the opportunity to grouse when clarity comes up. Is it a virtue of style? Honestly, I don't even know that I want to use the word virtue in this context, but sure, clarity is good, but we ought to be careful about how we're defining clarity. Because really, there are two major ways of thinking about language. Aristotle says that words are signs, and that they fail at their job if they fail to signify the intended things. And this sounds like a view that sees language as an objective system of meaning. One word means one thing, and if you want to refer to a thing, you find the word that means what you want to say. Ooh, but if you want to have a lot of fun, I'm sure that you definitely remember when we were talking about friend of the show Kenneth Burke's ideas of semantic and poetic meaning. Check that out if you want a refresher. But this first view is what Burke calls the semantic ideal. Words are like postal addresses for concepts. And it really is an ideal. It's just not how language works. If it were, we wouldn't be able to apply running to your legs and your nose. Those are very different things, so they ought to have very different words. On the other side, you have something more like Burke's poetic ideal, which sees language as a medium of performance, a way to gather and express attitudes, or even a plaything. When I call that chair a straight-backed, flat-seated torture device, I'm not using language to refer transparently to an object. I'm using it to perform a transparent attitude. And this is a different kind of clarity that almost never gets play in the style guides. And in my professional opinion, it's way more important. Semantic clarity makes your content clear. Attitudinal clarity makes your character clear. And of course, a balance is the best way to go, but I would much prefer to know who I'm dealing with than what they're saying. That is, semantic clarity that is too polished will probably make me a little suspicious. Why go to such lengths to smooth away your attitudes and character in the name of transparency? I don't like it. Not only that, and this really is a topic for another day, but I've been noticing that the more we rely on technological aids like autocorrect, Grammarly, or AI, everyone has started to sound the same. These tools, which are not programmed by people with very nuanced understandings of style, are making everyone sound like tech startup middle management. And frankly, it's a little creepy. So what's our takeaway? Well, Aristotle goes into all kinds of things, parts of speech, metaphors, similes, and we could too, but there's been better work on that since that we could talk about another time. Really, I think the key is this. Clarity is important but it's worth thinking carefully about what clarity means. Yes, you want your audience to know what you're saying, but you also want them to know something about you. And that's not just me making things up, at least not completely. Remember, part of our persuasive job is to show the audience our character. And if we sacrifice a little semantic clarity in order to make our trustworthy character more visible, that seems worth it to me. When it comes to the second virtue, propriety, Aristotle says that style is appropriate when it expresses emotion and character and is proportional to the subject matter. Proportion exists if there is neither discussion of weighty matters in a casual way nor shoddy things solemnly, and if ornament is not attached to a shoddy word. In other words, the way you speak or write should fit the occasion, and this has a natural connection to what we were just saying about the different kinds of clarity. An appropriate style is one that matches the dignity of its context. But again, we're talking about public discourse in ancient Greece. So if you're speaking about the need to go to war, you'd better speak with all the gravity that such a thing entails. It's probably not the time to show off all your best rhetorical tropes and figures. And if you're giving a speech to honor a war hero after the fact, then it's probably not appropriate to use a somber and restrained style. One of my favorite discussions of this comes from Richard Lanham. He writes, If you are telling a man he is going to take a cut in salary, that hard times are here again, you had better be long-winded, dismal, and above all, formal. That shows, one, that you see the gravity of the situation, two, that you feel the gravity of the situation as he does, three, that you are the kind of sober and reliable fellow who can deal with the situation. That is, all those rules about plainness and clarity and efficiency do not apply if you're reducing someone's pay or firing them outright. That is not the time for optimized prose because that would be pretty crass and unfeeling. And even if you're the kind of gremlin who doesn't really care about the person you're giving that bad news to, you should at least care that delivering it too efficiently 
will make you look like you're not equal to the occasion. If you know what you're doing, you'll do it in a way that reflects the seriousness of the moment. Where the stakes aren't as high, though, there's some room for play. Now, I'm not sure that Aristotle would love the way that Pablo Neruda used the noble ode to talk about things like socks and tuna, but think of the poetic effects you can achieve by flouting the kinds of conventions that normally govern other types of discourse. Which is just to say that, yes, again, Aristotle's ideas are good ideas. Propriety is a good quality for style to have, but don't just assume that what is appropriate in one context or for one kind of writing is appropriate for all kinds of writing. It probably happens all over, but the urge to overgeneralize stylistic guidelines seems especially prevalent. But Aristotle started us out way at the very beginning with the argument that a knowledge of rhetoric means knowing what the available means of persuasion are in a given situation. So knowing rhetoric means knowing that a style that works for emails at the office probably isn't going to work in text messages to your immediate family. What conveys competence and professionalism to your colleagues will in turn likely convey alienating detachment to the members of your household. So have an appropriate style, but whatever you do, pay attention to the context you're in in order to figure out what kind of style would be appropriate, because it isn't and can never be a one-size-fits-all kind of thing. Finally, Aristotle mentions that a good style will be correct, and honestly, I'm not going to spend any time on what he says because the usage rules of ancient Greek are not helpful now. If you really want to know what he thought, though, the book is a million years old and it's in the public domain, so feel free to check it out for yourself. But I also don't have that much to say about correctness in English, because honestly, what does anyone even know? It's not like there's a governing body of correctness, and it's not like English isn't a global language being used in so many different ways by so many different people for so many different purposes. Now, I read enough YouTube comments to know that people can get all worked up over the pettiest things, and there's no shortage of people who write letters to the editor because of missing commas or misspelled words. So are those people out there? Yes. Is it your job to please them? Not at all. Are most readers capable of reading right past your misplaced commas and understanding what you mean anyway? 100%. In fact, just between you and me, if I'm grading papers, I'm only commenting on correctness issues if it's an A paper. Those kinds of things are so minor and so easily fixed that it's not even worth bringing them up unless the actual argument is already in good shape. Not only is correctness so hard to pin down in any kind of way that would actually hold up, it's also really only an issue when it interferes with clarity or propriety anyway. So just focus on being clear and writing appropriately. Is a comma splice technically wrong? Yeah, but is it going to confuse anyone? I really doubt it. Now, before we quit, I just wanted to share a couple gems of wisdom from this section. These are things that I think are genuinely important and maybe more reliably generalizable to other genres in the way that Aristotle presents them. The first is something that Aristotle brings up when talking about clarity. He says, one should make the language unfamiliar, for people are admirers of what is far off and what is marvelous is sweet. Now, this seems like strange advice to give in a section on clarity, but I think it serves an important purpose. Part of the battle of persuasive discourse is that your audience doesn't have to listen to you. You can have the best facts and the clearest language, but that's not going to do you any good if no one's listening. And I don't just mean that you need to jazz things up to be more exciting. I mean that if you say things that people think they've already heard, they aren't going to listen. And familiar language has that effect. It's the same as Orwell's idea that writers should avoid writing things that they're used to seeing in print. If you've seen it in print, your readers probably have too. And if they've seen it in print already, it's not going to sound as urgent or insightful to them when they hear you say it. This is actually a major priority for poets, something that you'll hear referred to as defamiliarization. And that's one reason that they don't just say what they mean in plain terms. You won't find new insight in the 3,000th poem that says that autumn is time for orange leaves and steam rising off hot cocoa. There's just no need to read another poem that says the exact same thing again. Make the experience of autumn strange and unfamiliar in some way, though, 
and it's like you're experiencing it for the first time. You see something new and then listen more closely because it's not something you already know, or at least it's something you know presented in a way that you didn't expect. And I'm sure whoever the first ones were to call their political opponents communists and fascists scored big hits as they made their opponents' policies sound radical and dangerous in new and unfamiliar ways. But I'd be willing to bet that those same words have lost their bite over the years. They're overused and overfamiliar. So, instead of being daring new ways to describe the other side's policies, they've just become part of the white noise of living. And people tend to like novelty, and a style that just reproduces what's already out there will likely fail to pique an audience's interest. I mean, why would they spend time listening to or reading something that they think they've already heard before? Second, Aristotle talks about the concept of energia, or bringing things before the eyes of the audience, by presenting things that aren't living as if they were alive. And then he points to Homer writing that arrows are eager to fly, or that spears are longing to take their fill of flesh. In both these cases, we have inanimate objects given metaphorical qualities of life. And he also talks about how saying a person is foursquare, which I guess means something like complete, is a metaphor, but not one that signifies activity. Something like having his prime of life in full bloom is, though, because it conveys an action or liveliness. And so what? Well, again, remember that he's talking about public speeches that need to keep public audiences engaged. And an arrow eager to fly is more engaging than a pointy stick that isn't doing anything yet. But there's more to this idea of bringing things before the eyes, and I could go on and on about it, but I actually already have in the video about David Abrams' book, The Spell of the Sensuous. The short version, though, is that even if we like to think that we are intellectual geniuses who live in the world of concepts and ideas, the reality is that we are bodies with eyes, ears, and noses, and we interact with the world through our senses. Abstract ideas and notions are things that we draw from those experiences. So we learn the abstract principle that dessert is good from several lived experiences enjoying cakes, pies, and ice creams. The experience precedes the idea. So rather than just stuffing your audience full of abstractions and ideas, you can work with them more productively by bringing those ideas before their eyes with active living experiences. The soldiers were prepared for the enemy is an abstraction. It's an idea. We've been prepared before, so we can assume what a soldier's preparation must look like. But the state of preparation is not an experience, but a processed reduction of an experience. On the other hand, that the arrow is eager to fly is an experience. We're there with the arrow, feeling its eagerness, anticipating the rush of flight. And because our audiences are sensing beings first and conceptual beings second, our writing can only be more engaging when we focus on a style that brings things before their eyes than when we attempt to lead with abstractions that do not enter into eyes and ears as readily as the actual sights and sounds of life do. Now, for our final gem. At one point in the book, Aristotle is talking about the need to avoid saying unnecessary things, like how nobody would ever need to say the phrase white milk, because obviously milk is white. But in the kind of glimmer of humanity that almost gives me hope for academics, our dear translator George A. Kennedy writes this footnote. Common in the United States today, but Aristotle did not know about chocolate milk. I mean, come on, that's way too good. So friends, that brings us to the end. Now, did we talk about Aristotle, or did I use Aristotle as an excuse to talk about what I think? Does it even matter? These are the kinds of questions that we come to now. But this is also what happens when you put a person who specialized in style in charge of talking about style. If you open the valve even a little, it's all gonna come rushing out. So yeah, our buddy Aristotle had some things to say about style, and it turns out that I have even more things to say about style and about why I'm not totally on board with his take, even if it is mostly okay. And that's okay. If nothing else, I hope you'll take this as a chance to remember that you don't have to love or agree with everything a book says to still find some value in it. I think some of what Aristotle had to say about rhetoric is incredibly useful, and some of it aged like white milk. But that's fine. Keep what works and let go of what doesn't. Sometimes I think we get the idea that we have to either agree or disagree completely with an author or text. And then we throw everything out as soon as we run into something that ruffles our feathers. 
But that's not an actual rule. Even in this series, I've skipped over a lot of what Aristotle says because I just think it's tiresome. But there are some things that are part of my bedrock understanding of rhetoric, and that's normal. But it's also probably getting too far from the point of today. Really, what we've learned is that style is important, that style is one of the available means of persuasion, and that you shouldn't let anyone tell you what to do with your style unless, like me, they're telling you to be thoughtful about it in each new situation that you find yourself in. So with that final pat on my own back, we should probably wrap up before I get to be completely insufferable. Thank you, as always, for joining me today and sticking with me to the end. It really is hard to say how much it means to me. So please take good care until we meet again.